Does everything have a bright side to it? Of course. It doesn't always outweigh the negatives, but everything has a bright side to it. This makes happiness a choice. And here we say that the discipline of being happy is the ultimate discipline. With that said, welcome to the Ultimate Discipline Podcast, where we meet with people who are practitioners of this exact discipline, and we hear their cool stories of cultivating happiness through challenges in their life. I am your host, Sean Greenspan. Let's get to it. Hello, hello. I am so excited to have Britt Frank on the podcast today. She is the author of The Science of Stuck, and I think she practices what she preaches because we have had this scheduled and rescheduled seven times, maybe. And it's one of those that like, it was like the most painful emails for me to write. Um, I was like, oh, Britt, like I got to reschedule for this and this, but it was just stuff that came up. So you were always gracious about it. And hey, the fact that we stuck with it means a um, lot, lot of uh, pent up energy and uh, you know thoughts that could go into this so i'm excited about it and thank you so much for joining us Chris. thanks for being here it's good to finally meet you yeah absolutely um let me start by asking can you give me a little overview about the science of stuck yeah absolutely so i am a psychotherapist and a trauma expert. And I found that all of the really good brain, like the really good juicy brain info was either so academic and hard to get through or so poppy and not accurate, but just trendy that there was not a whole lot in the middle. And I really yeah. wanted to write a book that made all of the psychobabble approachable and accessible. Mm -hmm. Um, cause there's no reason to say in 50 words, what you can say in three. So the science of stuck is my show and tell of all of the best research that I've gathered, my personal recovery story, things that I use in my clinical practice. It's sort of my show and tell. I tell people it's not Brit's, you know, guide to life. It's here's Brit's show and tell on a decade mm -hmm. of doing this work professionally in a lifetime of being a human. So that's why I wrote it. And it's like little tiny sound bites that are based in research and you can follow the research trail if you want, or you can just grab some nuggets if you want. It's kind of the book, it's kind of the, like the kind of book you leave in the bathroom and pick up, you know, when you're there once or twice. I love day. that. I love that. You know, um, I think people's stories behind why writing books so interesting to me, you know, it's like you obviously were looking for some sort of solution. You know, I'd like to dive into your story if you're open to sharing it. Um, but you kind of, for yourself, it seems, and for others, were like, hey, like, there needs to be a, a better solution out there. Um, so, like, let me create it instead of complain about it. <laughs> that, and I'm not that altruistic. I think a lot of people get yeah. into the helping profession because they want to help people. And it wasn't, that wasn't my thing. I got into the helping <laughs> profession because I, can I swear on your podcast or should I keep it clean? Yeah whatever comes out. Yeah. <laughs> I got into the helping profession because I fucking love this stuff. And, it, you know, I didn't yeah. write the book to be helpful. I wrote the book because that was the book that my younger self really could have used. And like, yeah, there was a gap in the market and mm. I saw a need, but really I do this work because I love it. I think if you do the work that lights you up, you will by definition be of service to other people. But I don't do this work to help people. That's just a really fun, unintended consequence of what I do. Heck yeah. That's awesome. That's awesome. Tell me about the work you do today. Yeah. So I have a private practice and I started my career as a play therapist. So I worked with little kids and again, not because wow. I just love children. I, I do, but that wasn't the reason it was because I did. I wanted to understand, like, if we can understand how kids do humaning, we could probably understand adults because most of the problems Certainly. that we see are adults who have regressed and are acting like toddlers. So why not go to the source? And now I work with primarily adults, high functioning, high achieving, you know, people that want to go crush it. And they don't understand why they get stuck with relationships, with finances, with fitness, with whatever the thing is. Um, I help people get unstuck. Get unstuck. I love it. it. Makes me think almost about, have you read The Big Leap by Gay Hendricks? love that book. I love, I could not love that. Everyone that comes into my office is referred to that book. Um, I love everything. Wow. Yeah. Well, you know, I, 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 yeah, exactly. The upper limiting as far as getting unstuck, like it, 
it aligns. I just had Gay on the podcast. Um, I'm happy to introduce you guys. I'll introduce you guys for sure. That, that'll be Armageddon. super fun. Yeah. Um, now nah, he he was he was really really um he was exactly what you would expect him to be. Very gracious. I'm reading Conscious Living by him now. Okay. Um, and then I'm going to read Conscious Loving, um, the relationship one. That'll be fun. But it's it's a very empowering yet scary thought that we are the ones that can get us unstuck or stuck. Um, I've found that, that right, um, I was, uh, you know, got, got decent, you know, grades and, you know, played on some sports teams and was a captain. And like, you know, definitely like when I realized, when I started learning about this and realizing, oh, like this shit that's not going right in my life, like, you know, is I'm bringing that into my life was like, no, that can't be right. Like, (laughs) but then it's also empowering because it's like, Hey, if I got myself here, I can do something about it. And I find that really exciting. Um, man, I do want to go back to the play therapy for a second, because I think kids are geniuses, our best teachers, geniuses, right? They're just like, like on an energetic level, they're genius. They are geniuses. You know, we're like confused energy. They're like free flowing energy. Um, I, I, I do want to dive into that, but I, I am curious, like what, um, what different like mo I don't want to say modalities, but like what, what you, where'd you pull from to uh, write the science of stuff? Mm-hmm. Like what, you know, you know, is it, yeah, just leave it modality there. Is a, is a great word. So I'm personally trained in a therapeutic modality called somatic experiencing, yeah. which is just a fancy way to say your brain is attached to a body and your body does things and you're a biological being on a planet. And that's important to know. Um, I'm also trained in a model called internal family systems, which I love. And it goes into, if you've ever thought, why does part of myself know, don't do that yet. There's another part of myself that's like, yes, definitely do that. That's what that particular model um, works with. But the book has cognitive behavioral therapy. It has dialectical behavior therapy. It has mindfulness. It has spiritual principles. It has a little bit. It has business principles. It has military Mm. strategy principles. I really pulled from all of the resources that I don't think any one field has the lock on how to human. And so I think we do ourselves in the mental health world, particularly a big disservice by limiting ourselves to this really narrow thing. It's like, oh my God, no, like fighter pilots use this strategy back in the day. And it's really applicable if you're addicted to drugs. And this principle is really useful over here. And the business principles of cost and benefit and supply chain and inventorying, like that all applies to humaning as well. So I pulled from everything. (laughs) That's all. That's it's awesome because um, you know it's funny, right? Uh, my brother, my brother, the other day said something that was that was pretty cool. So um, he's definitely into um, self development and you know working on himself. Not quite. He, he doesn't focus on it. He does it pretty naturally, which is awesome. Um, he doesn't focus on it as much as me. And uh, we were talking about how like you are not your thoughts, right? And he, and he goes, yeah, you know, he's like, like, again, he, he naturally gets it. He goes, yeah, like your heart beats, your fingernails grow and your brain thinks thoughts like you're not your fingernails. Like, and I was like, like, he just broke it down so simply, so naturally. I was like, whoa, like for me, I'm like, no, I am my thoughts. This is what, like, this is where I experienced life from. But the the reason that um, I brought that up was like, I was, I was like, I never heard that before. And he was like, dude, I didn't make that up. I'm sure you're like, you know, and I was like, and I just realized that really everything in this like health and wellness space, especially in like the mental, spiritual, emotional space where it's less tangible is like, no one's making things up. They're just taking things from like what other people are putting it into their own words. And some people like, you know, I relate to my brother well, and he communicated it well for me. So like, it was better for me to hear it from him than wherever else I could have got the information. And I think a lot of times too many people try to come across as like experts or whatever. So I love to hear that you say like, I just pulled it from everyone, right? It's not like you invented any of this. Like people try to take credit for like all that stuff. Like I love that you pulled it from others. And that's probably, you know, continuing to iterate on previous thoughts. It's almost like you're picking up where their work left off. 
I think it's important to acknowledge where, you know, when I hear people come up, you know, I came up with the idea of take a deep breath to calm yourself down. It's like, wow, okay. <laughs> like, like that's been a th- or vagal toning hacks. Like that's actually been a thing for forever where you just find different language. But I think I agree with you. I think that there's nothing new and yet everything is new because you're the first person to think the way you think and to describe it the yeah. way you do. So I'm really big on share the credit where credit is due. And, you know, I snuck in a few of my own. I know I pulled some things, just here's the thing that they said. I pulled some things and mixed it together. And it's like, here's my soup that I made of those things. Yeah. But it's helpful to know where the things come from so you can go to it versus this is the expert, which creates a kind of a guru worship mentality, which creates dependence, which you know, takes away our autonomy and, we're, you know, makes us dependent on that expert, that person. So I, I'm really big on everything is relevant. Nothing is new. Everything is new and share the credit. Yeah, I love that. That's awesome. Um, let's go back to the kids. Let's yeah, go back to the, the kids. The I have a feeling the kids are going to be a theme here. Yeah. Um, I, you know, we kind of talked about like them being flowing energy. Um that's what do you what do you think we could learn from kids the most as it relates to um like living in the moment (laughs) it's so funny too because i i'm child free by choice i've chosen not to have kids and when i was in my practice the parents would be like well why should i listen to you you don't have kids i'm like i'm not a parenting coach i'm not a parenting expert because i don't have kids i have had lots of time to dig around in the sandbox and just observe i'm a child not a parent expert. So yeah, yeah, yeah. how kids think and speak and process is not the same as how to parent them. Parent them however you want. I know Dick all about parenting, but I can tell you that kids are among the most honest of creatures. And I've heard the definition of genius being you know, an innovative way to solve a problem. And children have no resources. They don't have fully developed brains. They don't have money. They can't drive. They have no autonomy. Nevertheless, most kids have to figure out a way to grow up in a very hostile world for many where really bad things are happening. That's not the definition of genius. I do not know what is. Um, As far as mindfulness goes, you know, this whole like kids are always in the present. It's like, no, they're not. If they're traumatized, they're completely not in the present. But watching a child dissociate is fascinating. Watching their eyes glaze over and seeing how quick and how hard they will check out if they're overwhelmed is something really yeah. useful to know because we do the same thing, except we can dissociate and drive and lead a presentation and do. Kids dissociate and they're gone. And that's a really important thing to witness because the same process happens inside of us. Yeah. Um, and I just I just want to make sure that I'm uh, following you, right? You're basically saying, right, a kid has a traumatic situation and they just feel it, right? Like they're 100% that, like they're almost like, present with the trauma versus like hiding is that kind of where you're getting at i'm going actually the complete opposite because kids have no resources they have no skills to feel the trauma so they have to split off from and dissociate and disconnect so half Mm. of our task as adults now that we have fully developed brains and resources is to put those fragmented pieces back together because you know, kids are mindful when they're playing. Kids are really present when they're in the moment. But when trauma hits a kiddo, they have no choice other than to split because what else are they going to do unless they have really competent, capable caregivers? They don't yeah. know what to do with those big, giant feelings. They don't know what to do with all of that overwhelm. And so the genius of childhood is the ability to, to say bye and totally fly off into space. And our task as adults is to rescue all those parts of ourselves that got fragmented in childhood yeah okay that's I, I really i really enjoy that i think um feeling is something that a lot of times we don't have time for as adults uh and you know like really good example right like i just i about 30 minutes before this call i closed a huge deal for one of my clients and instead of being like yay celebrate i was like got 10 minutes so my podcast you know i'm gonna crank out two emails get my microphone set up and get going <laughs> right um and it's like you know it's uh it, you start to develop patterns neurologically 
of skipping over that feeling. And, and I don't think that's useful. And I'd actually like to share, I'm working with a life coach right now and he is working with me, uh, you know, an entrepreneur who's starting his second business, who has, you know, a podcast, a blog. I've been trying to write a book for two years. Um, you know, I'm trying to train, like have a social, what I'm trying to do four or five too many things at once. (laughs) And, um, you know, like what he has me doing is sitting still every morning with my eyes open for 20 minutes. Some call it meditating. Um, he's like, no, we're just chilling. (laughs) Um, he knows how to use, he, he knows how to, uh, talk to me. And I've found that it's actually helped me feel quite a bit more. Like when I just sit there, when I, I, it is like unbelievable. Every single day I leave with a quote unquote profound insight. Like it's, it's remarkable. And, you know, of course, sometimes it comes early in the 20 minutes where I'm like, shit, I need to get up and write this down, but I just commit to it and I never forget it. Right. Cause you're actually, you know, clear and thinking it. Um, but it, it is funny how that, that kind of shakes out and how like actually giving yourself the time and, and mental uh, bandwidth to feel is quite important. Sure. Well, my question for you is, are you thinking or are you feeling during that time? Yeah. Um, thinking more than I probably should be, but I, I, I you know, I'm getting into the, uh, getting into places where I'm like feeling, um, my body and like just emotions that pop up a little more. And, um, I'd love to know where you're kind of trying to put, go with that question because, <laughs> um, you know, I, I, of course thoughts come up all the time, but, um, something that I love that he reassured me with, I actually made a video about it this morning was like, if you're sitting there and, you know, maybe the whole time you're thinking about what you're going to do next anxiously, but you sit there and you try a hundred times to just focus on the breath again, that's a huge win because that's reality, right? Like, you know, during this podcast, right? Like right when we started, the dog started barking crazy. And it's like, I could have drifted off into that thought, but I was like, Hey, I'm just going to stay here and just, you know, try to focus. Um, but I'd love to know where you're going with that question. <laughs> Have an agenda. Well, because 20 minutes of being in a feeling state sounds horrifying to me. And I say this as a psychotherapist and recovering person. I think this whole shift towards let's be in our bodies, let's be in our feelings is good. But we need to t- what's called titrating, meaning just a little bit at a time, which like you just said, feel the feelings, drift off, bring it back, come back to the breath think the thought, disappear, come back in. We're not supposed to be in the steady state of either feeling or the steady state of just thinking. Too much on either end is going to sort of blow the circuits a little. So when you're like, I'm sitting there feeling for 20 minutes, I'm like, holy shit, that sounds awful. Even in my most painful therapy sessions as a client, like with my therapist, we're in, and he's, you know, assured my system of this, which is we're only going to be in a big pocket of giant feelings for maybe 90 seconds, because your brain isn't going to be able to sustain more than that. Mm. We're not looking for pure feeling. We're looking for, can we go back and forth between the feeling state and the thinking state and the dissociated state and kind of create this web of existence that's not overwhelming to our physiology? Yeah. Because all of the information is great, but all of it has to get filtered through. We're biological animals that live in bodies and our brains can only tolerate so much before it's going to say, nope. Yeah. Can I ask you to elaborate on that a little? I have never really heard someone talk about that. Um, you know, you you hear it's kind of trendy now to, you know, get more in touch with your feminine energy and feel, feel, feel. Stop thinking, stop thinking, stop thinking. Um, yeah, I'd love for you to expand on that because I want to learn. <laughs> <laughs> So if you think of like the thinking feeling states like a seesaw, you you don't want to just be in your thoughts because that seesaw is going to have a giant 
brick on it and you're not going to be able to quote play. But if you can smoothly transition between the thinking state and the feeling state and sort of go back and forth, our nervous system is organized the same way, right? We have a sympathetic system, which brings us up and we have a parasympathetic system, which brings us down or like the gas pedal and the brake pedal on a car. You need both. If you look out to nature, the physical world, you know, for everything, there is an equal and opposite. And our mental, emotional, spiritual wellness is the same. We can't stay in one state or not supposed to be static. We're supposed to have a dynamic system that can shift between states. Mm -hmm. So I, I think of mental health as the ability and the capacity and the resources to shift between the states, not some Zen achievement of perma mindfulness. Like that sounds horribly boring, first of all. It also yeah. ignores our humanity and our physiology. We are physiological creatures that have nervous systems and senses that interact with the world. So we don't want a static state of anything. We want to be able to shift between this, you know, I can't drive a stick shift for shit. If you put me in a car with a stick shift, I'm going to really break things. And that's how our nervous systems often operate. We want to be able to go between thinking and feeling and being and, you know, strategizing and just existing, playing and getting to business, discipline and being totally free and spontaneous. We need all of it. Yeah. Yeah. That's really interesting. So coming full circle with the kids, right? Kids are really good at that flexibility of their emotional state you know, let it go and let it flow. Um, that's a, Dan Millman says that in the way of the peaceful warrior when he's talking about, I mean, a lot of people say it, but that's where my brain goes. <laughs> um, and <clears throat> I told you I have an athletic background. It, it makes me think about the metabolism, right? So a lot of people talk about like, there's a product called Lumen out there. You breathe into it. It says, are you um, burning carbs or fat with a one to five rating? Uh, my, I have some friends that are like, oh, I burn all carbs. Like, that's awesome. I can eat carbs. Like, or I burn all fat. Like, that's awesome. I might have no fat. Neither are good. What you want is to be able to burn carbs when it's time to burn carbs and burn fat when it's time to burn fat. And the ability to snap back regularly, quickly, um, and at the appropriate times, that's metabolic health, right? Um, and, you know, that, it kind of makes me think about that because, you know, what, 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 I talk about this with my girlfriend a lot. We're both 7 a.m. to 5 p.m., boom, 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 with meetings throughout the day. But the second, like, four or five or three or six, whenever we're done work, that hits. Like, like I just want to, like, snap the laptop shut and just be able to instantly dive into a deep conversation and go take a hike with her and, like, whatever. And we need to have the ability to do that. So I like that. Do you do – is there, like, practices or drills to teach that uh, flexibility? Uh, yes. And I just want, I could not love what you said about metabolic health more because it's the same principle. Again, if you look without, if you look within, if you look physiologically or you look spiritually, it's the same shit. It's the same principle everywhere you look. Health is the ability to coordinate multiple realities all at the same time without attaching to one state. So thank you for like drawing that line. I just know I'd, I have trouble with diet culture in general, but I really love what you yeah. said about that. So, okay. So cool. how to you train your system to shift, you know, and this is where the somatic meets the spiritual, which I love. I love it when the things all line up so we can, you know, like science is not incompatible with spirituality. Like you can have all of the things at the same time. So yes. after, and this is with the work, you know, working from home thing, which I love, but working from home makes it difficult because your brain has no signal that now it's time to shift. And so like environmental you know, signal. Yes. And that could be, you know, when my husband and I get home, we change our clothes. Even if we're working from home that day, when we're done working, we change our clothes. Everything cool. from what you are wearing to, you know, changing your shoes to even what you smell like is going to help train your brain. Like when I was writing The Science of Stuck, I had a certain like perfume that I wore every day because that helped my brain downshift out of whatever I was doing into now it's time to get writing. Now it's time to get into that flow state and smell your olfactory sense is a really powerful way to signal to your brain that we're doing something now. And so, yeah. you know, taking a cold shower as a way, we need transition rituals. You know, a lot of people- Taking a cold shower is the best for you. <laughs> amazing. It's one of the best hacks for 
almost all of the things. I really enjoy that particular tool. But we don't want to rush from thing to thing because our brain will not shift. So we need to signal to it. And that's where we can use rituals, where we can use our senses, where we, it really doesn't matter. It could be anything. It could be, I pick up my water bottle and hit it against my head twice and turn in a circle. And that's my ritual. That's what I love about this work is you can be as creative as you want, as long as it's something that do the same something, it'll work, which is great. Yeah. (laughs) I'm just laughing. I work in like the marketing space and one of my clients, she is big time CEO and she's trying to be more fun with her social media and we help with her branding and messaging and social media content. And um, we had her like dress up in all these different outfits and we were trying to figure out like how to like caption it and stuff like that. And I was like, I was like, just caption it as like, you know, what people really feel. And like, I feel like don't say and set like, you know, it's okay to put the costume on to help you get into the thing, like the, the right mental space. Like, you know, like, right, like I definitely wear, like I always wear, I always change to start the work day. And I feel like I put on a new energy and like, yes, I can work out in anything, but I also, I will enjoy like putting on like proper workout clothes it makes me feel more like uh i don't know it, it makes me feel like i'm just com- I, i'm i'm committing you know like i'm i'm here to work out i'm not here to like work out and do this like i'm just you know so i i totally like that and i liked how you were like i could take a water bottle and hit my head or whatever cuz you can you could do whatever like have fun it with it does, and people get so attached to prescriptive ritual right and again that's where this like guru thing comes in it's like no 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 you have to hit the water bottle against your head four times and you have to face towards the east and you have to make sure to do it right at sun it's like it doesn't matter if we're talking working with your brain it doesn't matter what you do as long as you pick something do it and repeat it and that's how you train your brain to know this means that it's classic conditioning you know if you do this thing if you ring the bell the dogs will salivate that old study it's the same principle just train your brain when you put your workout clothes on your brain knows this is what we're doing now and it'll shift if i was in my comfy clothes and my comfy socks and i walked over to a pull-up bar i'm not going to have the strength to lift myself up because my brain is like no we're in sit on the couch clothes that means we're just going to hit the brake pedal and we're going to deploy you know the rest and digest function when that's not what you want when you work out you want to be able to hit the gas pedal so yes ritual yes repetition and consistency i love it and i don't know why you had to bring up the pull-up bar i had a horrible (laughs) pull-up workout this morning no it was actually great it kind of it's kind of on the same theme right like um today i just there was a track quarter mile track with a pull-up bar in one of the corners um so i just ran a lap did a set of pull-ups to failure i did that for an hour um, I like to do weird. I, I like to train for everything. I want to be, I want to be strong, fast, durable, flexible, explosive, whatever. Um, and, uh, you know, it's like, I, that's how I train. Like everyone's like, what program are you on? I just do random stuff, but I make sure I mix it up and be consistent. Like, you know, I did that. And yesterday I just lifted really, really heavy static movements the day before everything was powerful, flipping tires, throwing sledgehammers the day before I only played basketball. But, you know, just trying to, like, completely, like, mix it all up, it's fun. Um, Britt, I want to ask if you would be kind enough to share a little bit about your story um, and kind of, like, the the way that you got into this through working on yourself. Sure. Um, and to your mix it up workout challenge, I have a yeah, challenge yeah. for you, and we can circle back Let's... over email. So I challenge you to do aerial workouts like aerial conditioning, trapeze, aerial hoop, aerial rings, aerial silks. I do that. It Number one is so goddamn hard because our bodies weren't designed for it. Number two, it forces mindfulness because when you're 20 feet up or 10 feet up, you have to be mindful. Otherwise, you get really really fast. And because you're spinning, your proprioceptive system is totally confused. So like my coach will be like, bend your right elbow and my left foot will do something. And so it is one of the workouts ever. It's like trying to do pull-ups while upside down and spinning. It's fabulous. So that's my challenge. I am I am so in. And we are gonna circle back on that. I'm I really it's anything. Like um I just signed up for a boxing gym. You know, like I'm I'm kind of goofy, uncoordinated looking but when I box. So I was like, let's get smooth, you know. Um 
Uh, and uh, I want to tell you the woman who invented aerial yoga, Carmen Curtis. She's a um, partner of ours. So I'll, I'll definitely, definitely introduce you. She has a, she has a cool like teacher training that I was actually interested in taking again, just to mix it up. I didn't think I could commit at the time, but we, we got a lot to circle back on, yes, we but do. yeah, I'd, I'd love to hear your story. Sweet. Okay. So that's part of childhood. Back in my childhood, I come from a long line of severe mental illness. You know, the, the legend in my family is that when my father was a child, the men in white coats came and took my grandmother to the hospital for shock therapy mm. and just really crazy trauma on both sides, as far as the eye can see. Yet, um, and I'm born and raised in New York, nobody did therapy. No one talked about feelings. The only feelings that were allowed were happiness or anger. For whatever reason, anger was fine. We could all be angry and scream at each other, or we can all be happy. But anything else- New Yorkers. Just... Yeah. My Hillary, family's from New York too. It's a traditional, stereotypical Long Island Jewish family is where I come from. So- uh, I'm, you know. uh... Yeah, I'm a Long Island Jewish family as well. So. Okay, so I see your trauma. Uh, yeah, so that was the, the place where I came from. So not being able to accurately identify feelings was difficult, but then you add in sexual trauma. You add in just a lot of weird family dynamics. It created this perma state of total confusion for me. And so by the time I became a teenager, it was like, how do I just escape? Like this, this body I'm in, I just want out. And so, you know, for a while it was school and I could just escape into school. And then I found drugs and that worked, you know, meth works a lot faster than reading a book. So like that became yeah. a thing. And then chaotic relationships became a thing. And I was always able to sort of stay above water functionally wise, which is why I'm really big on helping people know, like you can do well and be profoundly unwell. And it's not enough to just do well. It helps to do well and also be well. Otherwise, what's the point? Um, but I hit a point where I could no longer function. Had my, you know, what Brene Brown calls a spiritual awakening, I'll just call a hot mess of a nervous breakdown. Um, and, you know, started from scratch, was broke and, you know, sad and alone. Wow, wow, poor me, that whole story. And then looked around and I, again, I was fortunate to have the resources and the privilege to be able to access trauma therapy. And I was fortunate to be able to access the type of work that I now do. And it was not linear. It was a big meandering circle of, look, I'm reading a book, but then I'm going to go and do drugs and be a freak you know, that weekend. And then Monday morning, yeah. I'm back on track. And it was a very meandering path. But eventually, I found my way to somatic informed therapy, body based trauma therapy, where I had to bring it all the way down to you live in a body, here's how it works. No, you're not being attacked. This is how anxiety functions in the brain. No, you're not sick, your body is responding the way bodies are supposed to respond. You know, because I had the trauma from childhood and then yeah. my choices as an adult created more trauma. I'm big on not victim blaming. Like what happened to me wasn't my fault. I didn't ask for it. But I see how point A led to B, led to C, led to choosing D, led to E, led to F. And I agree with you what you said earlier. It's empowering to be able to own our story and own our choices, you know, to the degree that to the degree that we're able. Um, and so, yeah. yeah. Then I, I joined a religious cult for a while because I thought if I am just a good girl and someone tells me what to do and I listen, then I'll be okay. And that worked until it didn't. Drugs worked until they didn't. Relationships worked until they didn't. And eventually I had nothing left but to look at my own shit and go, wow, I'm a mess. And what do I do now? And so here we are. Yeah. Wow. Well, first of all, I appreciate you for you opening up about that. You seem pretty comfortable with it, but still... Um, you know, I know it's uh, it's something that I'm appreciative of because you're doing it so we can learn from it. And so some people can relate. Right. Um, you know, and, you know, some people can say like maybe, oh, like, you know, she, like I'll tell you, a, th a thought that I got was you said at one point, like you were like, you know, poor me. Right. I was broke. I was alone, blah, blah. And you were kind of like skipping over. And I started realizing like there um, there's some risk that I want to take in my life that probably wouldn't leave me broken alone if I took the risk. But I thought like if Brit was, you know, at this low point and was able to get out and, you know, become like an author and, and uh, you know, a therapist and all this stuff, like, you know, it's like, it, it helps level set risk taking, um, healthy risk taking, you know, even if it's not, whether the risk taking is work on yourself, 
like you're talking, change yourself, start a new business, whatever. Um, that's it. That's just something that came to my mind. But, um, man, that's a, it's, it's, it's pretty cool. Um, and something, it, it's pretty cool just to, to like, kind of like map out like where you went. And something that I'd like to ask is you turn this into your life, right? Um, what was that decision like? Like, was it like immediately you just kind of knew or is it kind of like you were just feeling it out and you, you like doing it more and then you kind of wanted to get involved? And... Yeah, no, I, w- I had a series of odd jobs. I was, you know, just sort of bouncing around law. So I worked in advertising. I worked in media production. I worked for a, a clothing company, like just random. I waited a lot of tables in a lot of cities for a lot of years. Um, I got to the point where I was obnoxious and what all I wanted to do was read about, talk about, be about all of this stuff that we now do. And it was like, I was at work one day and someone started crying and it was like this big drama scene. And I'm like, okay, what I want to do is grab all of these people that are flipping out and put them in a room and like talk about the feelings and figure out what went wrong. I'm like, okay, so I should probably pivot. And so then I just quit what I was doing, went back to grad school in my early thirties, got a waitressing job to help pay the bills in the meantime yeah. and pivoted hard. <laughs> it's uh, you have that in you. You have that in here, and I admire it about you. Um, you know, I thought about that entering this, even writing a book, right? Like, I think I have a good premise for a book, and I think I probably have 150 pages um, in voice memos and another 150 pages actually written in blogs. No cohesiveness to the, the different pages and stuff. But, um, you know, committing to it's a big commitment, and it's scary, but uh, for me, it's, uh, it, it is what I want to do. I'm, I'm sure of that. And I think I just need to, you know, send it, right? <laughs> just do well, it. The um, most uncomfortable, you know, scary vulnerability is like, if you want to write a book, go to a bookstore and look at how much shit is out there. Like, it's really encouraging if you have imposter syndrome, because I know I compare myself to really, really awesome people that are doing incredible things. And how could I ever think that I could blah, blah, blah. But if you look the other direction, there's just as much crap out there as there is good stuff. So first you look up and feel like crap. Then you look down and feel superior. And then you realize neither side is real and neither side has anything to do with what you're meant to do. And then it's just a numbers game. And then it's just a bunch of at-bats and you get told no enough times, you sort of become immune to it. I got told no uh, many, 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 like hundreds of times before my book journey turned into an actual book. Yeah, we're going to we're add it to the list of things we're going to follow up on. I'm going to be like, how do I write a book? Teach me every step. Do it for me. <laughs> write the book for me. <laughs> uh, this is this is um, awesome. I, I have a, a tough question for you that I would like to just kind of get your opinion on, I'd say. So um, if we're going to just group people, people are either into this stuff or they're not, right? You know, some people, like I'm probably a little obnoxious that right now my girl's, my girlfriend's going through a traumatic knee injury. And like, you know, me, I'm the whole, the whole time I'm just kind of like, you know, it, it's, it's all about your, like your mental state, like just like, you know, whatever, whatever. And she's like, she's supposed to be like getting into full range of motion. And I'm just like, you know, you're not going to injure it worse. Like it's, it's all like, you know, mental, like you can work through this. And, um, and then you have people that just like vomit at this discussion, right? Don't want to talk about themselves, you know, probably makes them feel bad or whatever. Um, but either way, people on both sides need to kind of like take action. And a question that I've gotten asked a lot was like, you know, like, not when do I take action, but like, why am I taking action? And I've realized a lot of people that don't enjoy talking about it um, think like, oh, like, unless like I'm like clinically depressed, there's no need to like act on it. Right. And, 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 and meanwhile, they're not getting tested if they're clinically depressed. Um, so it's like, they're just like avoiding it entirely. But I'd love to really just, I don't know, understand, understand from your point of view, like, you know, 
someone that's like trying to get how how I can help people who I am pretty confident could use help but might not be open to it. You're not gonna like my answer at all. But nevertheless, be... I stand by this. How do you help people that don't want help? You can't. You can't. Like those aren't your people. Then it's you know, and people say to me all the time, Well, why should I do it? I'm like, don't. Like if you're happy with your life, I mean, the biggest contributor to staying stuck other than oppression and poverty and systemic failures, assuming that's not a thing, the biggest contributor to being stuck is self-deception. Like if you, and I get it because I was queen of lying to myself about myself. If you're sitting there going, I'm fine, my life is fine, but you know, you're unhealthy and you're not sleeping and you have a six hour a day screen habit. I'm not going to sit here. I'm not trying to sell you on why you should do the work. I'm here when that Mm. doesn't work, which it won't call me when you're ready. So I'm really big on leave people alone to their own devices. And eventually they're going to realize it's not working and come calling or I respect, this is a big one. And I had a hard time learning this, but I respect people's right to choose to stay stuck. I'm not here to tell you that Yes, I see your capacity. Yes, I see your potential. I see what it could be. But I respect your right to do jack all if you don't want to. Yeah. I don't dislike that. It's actually <laughs> a, it's actually a relief, right? Okay. It's a stress relief um, of not, not bearing that weight. You know, a lot of these people are family members, close friends. Um, and yeah, you know, I, I think I've gotten a little better at detaching myself from their happiness, but there's definitely a long time where I'm just kind of like, oh my God, like I see this, I see this, I need to do something, I need to do something, I need to do something. And you know, you, know, you don't. It's yeah. It's sad and that requires the willingness to accept people's autonomy and to grieve the reality. No one in my family is into therapy. No one in my family really talks about what I do. It's sort of like, we just keep it real polite and real friendly, which is fine. But I had to really do some deep grieving that, oh my God, it would be so, I remember I was like 28 or so. And I called my family. I'm like, oh my God, I just learned about this awesome thing called boundaries. And I got told boundaries is the most disgusting thing a child can say to a parent. We never want to hear that word from you again. It was like, oh, shit, this is not my audience. And as I've moved through my healing, I've had to accept this is what they've chosen and it's not my job to heal, save, fix, or change. And I get to decide what does that relationship look like properly boundaried so I'm not constantly feeling crappy. Yeah, that's, I think there's an abundance of information out there. There's a trend right now around spiritual, mental, physical, emotional, and social well-being and i think a lot of the younger generations are trying to push this on older generations and you know i think that's a good message to be sent out that like hey respect your boundaries like um because i've had you know discussions with my parents where i'm just like you know feeling that kind of that way as well like i want to share it with them i want to bring them along but um you know i can also just resolve to appreciate the relationship as it is it's true as a helping professional too. Like people ask me all the time when I do like therapist consults or life coach, like, well, how do I help someone who's addicted to something? I'm like, you don't. Your job is not to fix help or save. Your job is to share information and to witness. And sometimes and I hate this about what we do, but sometimes our task is to be a travel companion for someone who doesn't want to make changes and mm-hmm. just say, all right, but if you don't want to change, I'm not here to shame you, guilt you. As a helping professional, I'm not invested in your choice because I'm not your wife, your sister, your friend, or your mother. So I can sit here human to human and be a travel companion if this is the path you're choosing. And again, that gets into you have to be ethical and boundaried and just but generally speaking, it's really freeing to know my job is to share information and to be a travel companion and what you do yeah. or do not do with it is on you. And I, you know, my goodness is not defined by your choices. And that frees us up as helping people to not be attached to our clients' outcomes because that creates manipulation yeah. and all manners of fuckery. So like, don't do that. <laughs> no, I, I, I love that. I think it's a, I think it's a great thing for people to walk away with. Um, it's a little freeing, right? Because I, I can think of several people in my life that, uh, you know, feel that way and feel that pressure on themselves. And um, I have not read your book. I will be buying it today. And I'm excited to read it. It's on, is it an audio book? I read the audio too. That was fun. <laughs> I get it. So I get it. 
See, I get to talk to you and listen to you for a few hours. Now I got to write a book so you can listen to me. No, I'm yeah. <laughs> um, I actually really like when authors uh, uh, dictate their own book. It's cool. Um, but I'm stoked to listen to it. I'm actually kind of happy I didn't read it before this. You know, it came in just blank slate. But um, Brett, I just want to thank you so much for coming on. And, um, you know, I will share in the show notes for ways that people can find your book, find you on social media, and, um, you know, kind of follow you, whether they want to work with you, contact you, or just follow your journey and learn from awesome. you. Thank you so much. And I look forward to hearing about your circus journey. Oh, I definitely, we will definitely circle back on that. That's a promise. <laughs> hey, thank you for watching today's episode. If you got something out of this, it would mean so much if you could just take a second and give us a rating on whatever platform you're watching it on. And it would mean so much to the world if you could just find one person that you think this message resonates with and you could share that with them. Thank you so much for your support. Looking forward to share the next episode with you.